And I am going to get into how the increasingly unhinged movements to tear down anyone and anything that does not conform to the constantly mutating standards of wokeness is not only useless against this system and the rising fascism, but is actually serving to fuel it. I'm here with Rafael Caderas, who's a member of the RNL Revolution Nothing Less show crew and has been on tour giving a, a part of the program with Sansara Taylor on woke lunacy uh, versus real revolution. Welcome, Raf. Uh, thanks for having me, Andy. All right. So I think, we, you know, we're going to show tonight, I announced this earlier, some of the Q&A from that tour, but I think it'd be important to tell our audience some of why are we doing a tour? at this moment against this woke lunacy and contrasting it with a real revolution. Yeah, well, I think if you've been watching this show, you've gotten a sense of, you know, the very serious situation in the world and the fact that it's intensifying and it, it's accelerating, you know, when it comes to the Republican fascists calling for civil war against their enemies or, you know, the environmental dis destruction of our planet, the, you know, the, the war proxy war that the U.S. is waging in, in Ukraine right now is very dangerous, could turn into a nuclear war. All the attacks on people's rights, on black people's rights, on immigrant rights, on women's rights being s snatched away on LGBT people. And, you know, this is a time when students, intellectuals, young people in general need to be like, like asking the biggest questions, why, are, why is this happening? What's it going to take to deal with this situation? You know, discussing and debating reform or revolution. Um, but what's dominant on these college campuses right now is this whole framework of woke identity politics, which is just shutting down that conversation. It has people, you know, focused on self, focused on their identity not looking at the big picture, hiding from reality and, you know, with safe spaces and trigger warnings and canceling each other instead of canceling the system. So this is a big problem and it's a big obstacle to the revolution we need. This is something that Baba Vakin has been calling out for years and writing one article after another about this. But this is something that uh, Sansara Taylor, myself, other Revcoms have, you know, are now launching a major campaign in the public square to take this on and to challenge students to break out of that whole framework and, and get into this revolution. You know, I mean, I, I understand um, or I, I can see, you know, why people uh, want to do something about microaggressions and stuff like that. No one should tolerate it when people are racist or sexist to them. But we got to look at the big picture. You know, we got to look at the, the macro situation that humanity faces. So this is what this tour is. Not just taking on this woke identity politics framework, which we are exposing it, demolishing it, dissecting it from many angles, but also lifting people's sights to a whole different way to understand, to radically change the world, and to, re to relate to each other. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing I want to say, uh, I think it's important for, but to really, for, we're going to get to some of the Q&A, which I want you to introduce, but um, you need to go back two episodes ago, I think, maybe it's three, and watch Sansara's whole speech. And then and I think last week we went into more of the Q&A because it's, it's, it's very rich, uh, exactly what you were just saying, but why don't you set up what people are going to see uh, tonight? Yeah, so the UCLA event was really exciting. There were 125 people there, students, professors, and others. Um, Sansaris gave a very powerful speech. Um, some wokesters actually came and tried to disrupt it. She then invited them to come and, you know, wait for the Q&A and raise their questions, but they just walked out. Um, but there were a lot of people who also just came to, to hear the argument and to raise thoughtful questions. We'll hear one of those in a minute. But the first question was from a pro-Trump Christian fundamentalist uh, MAGA student. So he was part of a group of, of them that came. So let's watch. 
My question is, how does abortion liberate women when the vast majority of abortions are done in order to further their careers or education, used just to get careers and be enslaved by corporations, or be slaves to their sexual urges, like the sex work supporters that you mentioned, in place of the slavery that you are talking about? That's a fabulous question. Um, I'm trying to remember your question. I just uh, did not like, okay. What, how does abortion help women? It means that women are not chattel. They're not baby making machines. They're not incubators. They're full human beings. And being a full human being, sexuality is part of that. Being a parent, if you choose to be, is a part of that. It can be a beautiful part of it if you want to be. But being forced to have a child against your will is like being forced to have sex against your will. It's akin to being rape. It is violent control over a woman's body and her life by a patriarchal male-dominated society. And a woman should have the right to an abortion on demand without apology for any reason she chooses. And I will add, and I will add, hold on, hold on, you want me to answer? I will rape add. Rape is not the only cause. What? Rape is not no, the no, only no. cause for women to get Okay, a please, please. Reasons. Yeah, 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 yeah. The vast majority of abortions are not caused by rape. I, I didn't claim that. I know maybe you're nervous and you didn't hear me fully. I said forcing a woman. No, seriously, forcing a woman to have a child against her will is akin to rape. Is akin to rape. It's violent control of women. I did not say most abortions are caused by rape. Most abortions are caused because a woman is pregnant and doesn't want to be. And I will tell you, there are many. Hold on, hold on. There are many, many. Okay, I'm sorry. There are many, many good reasons to have a child, but being pregnant is not one of them. Being pregnant is not a good reason to have a child. Having your birth control fail is a stupid reason to have a child. Being horny and hooking up with somebody is not a sin, it's not enslavement, and it's not a good reason to have a child. Hello. So my first question is, why do you think wokeism, whatever you want to call it, uh, became the dominant way of thinking about these issues? Mm -hmm. compared to you know something else was it just luck or was there something inevitable about you know yeah. wokeism that uh or yeah was there something inherent in wokeism that kind of just made it inevitable mm -hmm. uh and then my second question is what is your guys's take on artificial intelligence and its its impact like has it had any change and has it caused any change in the way that you think about your movement at all because it's, it's going to kill a lot of jobs <laughs> that's true um so uh on ai i am going to say if anybody wants to we should do a salon and a chat sometime about it we could have an open space we could do a zoom we could find a way to explore it i'd love to hear people's thinking on it we are also processing how to understand this there's a lot of learning going on in this i'm not prepared to make a global statement about it, except that it is a profound change that we have to learn more about. Um, on your other question about why is wokeism the dominant form of, of thinking and accommodation among the decent people? Was it inevitable? Where did it come from? Was it accident? I think it was neither total accident nor was it inevitable. Um, but I think there are at least two major, two, maybe three, or maybe two bit major reasons I could point to. One is that there has been, for quite some time, a rejection of, and it, it corresponds with the defeat of revolutions in the last, in the, in the first stage of communist revolutions and of the revolutionary upsurges of the 1960s here and around the world. When those were defeated and people's sights were lowered, one of the things that people reached for instead and that got institutionalized in academia and in other places is a lot of relativism identity politics and postmodernism, which is again anti-scientific and anti-revolutionary. And this got, somebody shouted out, and I don't know where they're coming from, but they said it got institutional backing, it did. It's not the only thing that got institutional backing, so did a lot of really like right-wing fascist things, but this also got institutional backing, and so this has been the indoctrinated 
outlook for, for several generations now of, of you proceed from your identity, you proceed from you, standpoint epistemology, everybody has their own truth, there's no objective reality, or maybe there is, but you can never know it objectively. So all of this has been brewing, and then um, it combines with just the tremendous, profound parasitism of this country that feasts on and sits on the people of the world. I talk about where our clothes are made, where our food comes from, where the coal tan in our cell phones come from, where it's assembled. This is global networks of exploitation and oppression. And you're sitting atop the food chain in this country. And you might care, and you might want to do something about it, but you're pretty comfortable. And doing something about it means you have to go up against real things. You have to struggle. You have to sacrifice. You have to put it on the line. And so this became a very, very convenient way of saying, I'm doing something, I'm changing words, I'm changing my tiny space. But you're sitting there cushioned and, and, and hiding from the larger things. So there's a lot of American chauvinism, a lot of American parasitism, a lot of American privilege, which is also why the wokesters never talk about American privilege and never fight against it. So this is, but it's, it, so these are two big things that came together, and I guess the third I will say is that we are now, especially in this time of rapid change, of, as he said, uh, pre-Civil War conditions in this country, of the country ripping apart in major ways, of major laws and changes in society, the, the fascists are armed to the teeth and preparing for and hungering for a civil war and a purge of all those that they deem subhuman. Black people, immigrants, women who are uppity, LGBT people, trans people, they're speaking in genocidal terms and they're deadly serious. And in the face of that, there's an even greater freak out among the decent when they don't have the scientific tools they need and they don't know that there is actually a different way the world could be. They don't know about the revolutionary way out. They don't know about the new society that's possible. They don't know about the revolutionary leader, Bob Avakin, who spent 50 years forging this science and putting himself to figuring out how we could actually win a revolution, what we would replace this with, learning from the past struggles to do better, including the approach to science. And so they don't know this, so they are even more freaking out and, and, and getting this, you know, I described the dynamic where the more that the fascists lash out, the more the wokesters freak out and, and get more and more fanatical and the decent people get silent in the middle. But we have to change that. And I think right now, and I don't know how much longer we want to go, but I want to say right now, it is not only extremely destructive, the fascists love this woke shit. They love the way the decent people are cannibalizing each other and are soft prey, easy kill. Steve King, the fascist former congressman from Iowa, Bob Avakian quoted him in a tweet. He said, look, a lot of people are talking about civil war these days. Well, one side has eight trillion bullets and the other side can't figure out what bathroom to use. Now that has a lot of anti-trans slander that's fucked up. But unfortunately, there's too much truth to it too where our side is, is caught up in a lot of in, like bullshit, easy prey, easy kill. And we have to change this. We have to change this rapidly. And I believe not only is there a heightened need, but in this time of great convulsive change, when a lot of questions are being forced upon people, we have the opportunity to change this rapidly. And that's what we're trying to do with this speaking tour. We're trying to take it on head on not just on this campus and then another campus and then another campus. We want this to become a poll in society for all the people who feel sad on and who really want to know a way out. And we want to fight to spread this tour, to spread the news of this revolution, to spread this is a whole breakdown of what the revolution's about and the mechanism for making it. And on the back, it has these resources. This needs to get out by the millions. And everybody here needs to play a role in it, learning, spreading it. It says. Watch the interviews we did with Bob Avakian. You've never seen a revolutionary leader like this. The heart, the humanity, the humor, the hardcore determination to make a revolution, the far-sightedness, the vision. This is an incredible interview. Watch it. it. Says about who he is. Get with the Revolution Club. It has connecting material. This we have to take this everywhere, and we have to take this tour everywhere because there's a moment where, when the rulers are divided, we could actually have a go at bringing forward the people to bring this system down. And so that's, you asked about wokeism and what led to it, and I'm describing that, but I'm also saying the very conditions that led wokeism to go kind of out of control, hysterical right now, 
both require and make possible, those same conditions make possible, this revolution growing in an out of control way too, but only if we fight for it now. So that's my challenge to everybody here. Thank <laughs> you.